Good morning again, First Unitarian. Uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, the uh, famous liberal economist, once said, the conventional view protects us from the painful job of thinking. The conventional view serves to protect us from the painful job of thinking. Today, uh, I want to explore intellectual courage. And in coming weeks, we'll be looking at other kinds of courage, emotional courage, spiritual courage, social courage, physical courage, and more. Courage, it does strike me as something um, desperately, ever increasingly needed in our world right now. Turns out intellectual courage, though, is a little like the 90% of drivers who uh, will tell you that they are better than average. Uh, nearly everyone thinks they already have it. But being willing to look at and accept evidence, even when it contradicts your previous beliefs or values, turns out to be a pretty good definition of intellectual courage. Some other qualities of intellectual courage include a willingness to discard conventional views and think outside the box, a willingness to consider and even include someone else's point of view, being willing and able to argue against your own point of view, and being in both honest curiosity and honest skepticism are both indications of intellectual courage. Honest here meaning that you're willing to apply curiosity even to things you don't agree with, and skepticism even to the things you already do agree with. And lastly, for our purposes, uh, intellectual courage has to, a lot to do with being relentlessly committed to the truth, which kind of circles us back around to that point I made about evidence. One of the most accessible ways of learning intellectual courage, and it is a teachable skill, is understanding confirmation bias. And that's the tendency to interpret information in ways that support the things we already believe and to block or ignore information that undermines our existing beliefs. And everyone does this. We all do this. We are literally wired to do this. You want a clear, obvious example? Compare the coverage, news coverage of our president on MSNBC and on Fox News. Doesn't matter what the story is about. It could be foreign policy or a golf outing or a controversial quote, but both of these outlets filter information in very specific ways to appeal to very specific audiences with very specific social and political agendas. Both of them tend to create echo chambers that aren't good for anyone. Confirmation bias informs racism and ableism and misogyny and genderism and homophobia and do dozens of other ways that cultures teach expectations and organize themselves to include or exclude, to reward or to punish people for who they are who they love, how they look, how much money they have or don't have, and on and on. What we believe, even things we aren't even aware that we believe, largely determine what we see. And what we see largely determines what we think our options are at any given moment in time. I've used this example before, but it's a really good one. If you are someone who believes that the world is a cold, hard, unforgiving place, you will almost certainly experience it that way. And you will see evidence to support your conclusion everywhere you look. It is likely you won't even become aware of opportunities for goodness or joy or peace even when they happen right in front of you. On the other hand, if you believe that the world is a mysterious, miraculous place of possibility and wonder, I promise you will see evidence to support that conclusion everywhere you look. It is also just about virtually guaranteed you will live a life of greater success, more happiness, and greater satisfaction.
on a very personal, sort of relational level. If you are someone who believes you are deserving of love and of intimacy, you will tend to gravitate towards emotionally healthy people who can enter into that kind of relationship and sustain it. If you are someone who deep down does not really believe that you are worthy of love and intimacy, you will, in all likelihood, gravitate towards other wounded, closed, inconsistent, preoccupied, or perhaps even selfish people who will, in all likelihood, live out your fears. And of course, right, we've all known um, we've all known people who are, who are not nearly as lovable as they like to think they are, just as we have all known um, the tragedy of beautiful, precious souls who, for whatever reason, continually make terrible, self-destructive life choices. Confirmation bias is no joke. Thinking about this religiously, and remembering the image of Donald Trump standing in front of a boarded-up church holding up a Bible, I was reminded of an article by Mark Sandlin in Sojourner's, Ma Sojourner's Magazine a few years ago. It's called, Ten Things You Can't Do While Following Jesus. And I'm going to hold up just seven of them. And President Trump, if you're listening, i got to say this, um, this part of my message is just for you. One, if you follow Jesus... You can't exclude other people based on their religion. There's not a single record of Jesus asking for a person's religious affiliation before being willing to speak with them, break bread with them, or to heal them. Two, if you follow Jesus, you can't exclude people for hardly any other reason either. If you read the Bible you were holding up, you would see that it was the outcasts and the lepers and the poor and the sick and the marginalized that held a special place in the mind and the heart of Jesus. Three, if you follow Jesus, you can't withhold health care. You just can't do it. When people were sick, Jesus gave healing away for free. No hesitation, no qualifications, no politics, no copays. No excuses. Four, if you follow Jesus, you can't let people go hungry. You certainly cannot lock them in cages. Jesus could not be more clear. All of the parables speak in one way or another to the bounty of the earth, the rights of all people to participate in that bounty, the holiness of generosity, the necessity of sharing resources, and how no one, no one is to be left behind. That is the essence of the gospel, if you care to actually read it. Number five, you can't make money or things or power or legal systems more important than God or the children of God. And if you do, then you're not following Jesus. Six, you can't judge other people with the possible exception of rich people. All that stuff about the speck in your brother's eye and let he who has without sin cast the first stone, we just, we just have to assume Jesus was serious about that. And seven, I'm going to end with this one. You cannot hate. You just can't. Not if you follow Jesus. One possible exception might be hating hate itself, but even then, Jesus is pretty clear that hate only breeds more hate. Best to avoid it altogether. We're talking this morning about intellectual courage, examining and being critical about our own thoughts, our own assumptions, our own behavior. And I'm leading up to speaking to what this congregation stands for. In a time of echo chambers and possibly unbridgeable social and political divisions, in a time of very little intellectual courage on the part of leaders where it counts, what does it even mean to have banners on our walls that say there's a unity that makes us one and all souls are sacred and worthy? What does that even mean in this day and age? 
I continue to believe and work for and invest in, believing that our purpose as a community, my purpose as a leader in this community, is to be about the twin tasks, the twin ideals of healing and liberation. Those two. These two values are the ideals toward which we strive. The task we joyfully take up, the morals toward which we preach and sing and praise and gather ourselves. Healing and liberation. Healing the wounds from a world that denies the humanity of too many precious lives. Liberating ourselves from the demons of false divisions self-imposed limitations of thought and of spirit, destructive assumptions of individualism, as if it were even possible for anyone in this world to rise or fall or laugh or cry or die or be, be reborn all by themselves in a vacuum. We are all in this together, healing and liberation Remember those words, think on those words, pray on those words, apply them to yourself and to each other. I'm not saying we're perfect or that we always get it right, because we don't. I'm not saying we always have the courage to face the things we need to face. I'm not saying that, because we don't, at least not always. I am saying that we're clear that our purpose is higher and more noble than any merely cultural assumption. I'm saying I've never seen a better set of values from which to base my life and my behavior, and I've never known a people I'd rather be together with in community, and in loving mutual accountability. May we continue to be an imperfect church with an imperfect pastor and imperfect members welcoming the imperfect public so that grace may abound. Amen.